Uh, so our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. John Mendelson, is currently the director of the Khalifa Institute for Personalized Cancer Therapy. It's a very exciting new venture. Uh, just to give you a little introductory background so you know a little bit more about Dr. Mendelson, he uh, graduated from Harvard College in Science, then spent some time as a Fulbright Scholar in Scotland, and then earned a medical degree, cum laude, from Harvard Medical School, and then went on and started building things. He founded the uh, National Cancer Institute Designated Cancer Center at the University of California, San Diego, and then was a uh, Chair of Medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and then became president of MD Anderson Cancer Center, and was there from, uh, I think, 1996 to 2011, um, and oversaw tremendous growth at MD Anderson and uh, built it into the number one cancer center in the world while, during his time there, and, and uh, is still a pioneer in the field of targeted therapy, and I think you're going to hear a lot more about that tonight. He's been honored extensively for his many contributions to cancer research. I think most recently he was inducted as a fellow into the brand new uh, American Association of Cancer Research Academy and uh, has a number of other uh, awards as a member of the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine. And uh, I don't want to talk, cut into his talk uh, anymore just to say that we're very pleased and happy that he could join us tonight and uh, I hope you enjoy hearing what he has to say. It always happens, people sit in the back and there's a lot of empty seats in the front. Well, uh, I have some thank yous, first to Susie Cox and the Bush Library, and secondly to uh, Penny Riggs and the Texas Genetic Society for inviting me to talk with you tonight. It's an honor and a pleasure. <clears throat> I've learned that this audience includes uh, students, faculty, community, uh, citizens from the community, and of a wide variety of people, so I will try to <clears throat> speak to everybody, and sometimes I'll be talking down to some of you, and sometimes I may be talking up to some of you, but uh, we'll get along together fine. And if you have questions during this, you can raise your hand, or otherwise I hope there'll be time afterwards for some questions. Let's see. So I'm going to begin uh, <clears throat> by the fact that Last year, we celebrated the birthday of targeted therapy. Uh, uh, Paul Ehrlich won the Nobel Prize in 1908 for immunotherapy, but at that time, he was working on chemotherapy, uh, in this case, drugs against bacterial infections. And uh, he was a brilliant scientist. And on the left is, a, is my diagram copied from a, a paper he wrote in German, uh, but I sort of waded through a bit of it. Uh, where you see on the surface of this cell uh, objects that he called receptors, and he postulated they could be internalized and they could carry molecules into the cell. Now, why did he brilliantly think about this? Because this is how a cell works. He was a pathologist, and the German dye industry had produced dyes, and the pathologist used to look in the microscope and just see white with a little bit of black lines around it. And they found that if they put dyes on top of the slides with germs on them or cells on them, selective dyes sp uh, stuck to one cell and not another cell, or one type of germ and not another germ. And the dyes were organic molecules. And he postulated there must be receptors that are specific for those dyes on some cells and not on other cells. And that uh, we, it turns out there are receptors specific for sugar and for the amino acids we need and for everything that gets inside a cell. And this is a, a Gedanken experiment. He had no data to prove that. He deduced it. He then said, well, uh, there are dyes that attach to bugs and don't attach to people's cells. Why don't we attach a poison to those dyes and see if we can introduce the poison into the cells, uh, into the bacteria, without damaging the cells. And he began work on that in Germany in the early 1900s. <clears throat> now, the uh, poison he used was arsenic. He linked it to a, a number of uh, different polycyclic hydrocarbons. And he put them in cell culture and to see what would happen. 
And in this case, he, he was uh, using a, um, a mouse model of trypanosomiasis. I don't know why he picked that. I think it was an easy model. And uh, he was looking at efficacy and toxicity. And the 606th compound he screened, he screened 606 compounds, uh, which became known as salversan, was, again, was effective uh, against syphilis in a rabbit model. And I forgot to say that trypanosomiasis doesn't occur in Germany. So once he had worked this out, he switched to syphilis, which doesn't occur in mouse models. So he had to use rabbits, which are much harder to work with. But around uh, 2005, he created a biotech company uh, separate from his university. Uh, during a t five year period, he scaled up production of 606. He ran clinical trials. He collected data on efficacy and toxicity. This is the first time I know of when, we, when someone systematically tried a new drug out in the way we're still doing it today. And he created a blockbuster. He did not cure syphilis, but it was the first drug that had an uh, effect upon syphilis. Now, uh, I'm not going to run through all of these, but uh, in the period beginning in 1941, that's about 30 years later, uh, 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 drugs began to be developed that targeted cancer. And the first ones had to do with hormones. Uh, Huggins showed that if you removed androgen uh, uh, from a patient with prostate cancer, uh, the cancer would regress. In 1944, on this chart, it was first proven that DNA is the genetic material. We all know the date of 1953, uh, when the Watson-Crick model was published. But I think it is even more amazing that when I was born, we did not know that DNA was the genetic material. And today, we are working with genes and putting them into cells and studying them the way we do. Uh, I'll point out here that in 1983, <coughs> when I was at UCSD, in collaboration with Gordon Sato, we published the first paper designing a drug to attack the product of a gene that causes cancer. In this case, the gene coded for the EGF receptor, which is a tyrosine kinase. And I'm not going to explain what a tyrosine kinase is, but it's an enzyme. It is important for cell proliferation. And about half the new drugs against cancer today attack tyrosine kinase. Oops, we got a very sensitive pointer here. Uh, and uh, in 1996 uh, to, to 2001, uh, wow, I'm not going to use the pointer anymore. <laughs> uh, the, the miracle drug was developed, Gleevec. Uh, chronic myelocytic leukemia uh, has an average lifespan of three and a half years. Today, uh, almost all the patients live at least a decade, and many of them are cured, as long as they take this drug, which attacks the product of the bcr able gene rearrangement. So here we have a drug targeting a gene, which is essentially given uh, a predicted normal lifespan to someone whose predicted lifespan would have been uh, three and a half years. And I'll talk about the battle trial in a few minutes. So in the past decade, there have been a number of new drugs that have been developed, uh, not uh, just poisons that we hope hurt the cell, uh, the, the cancer cell, more than they hurt the normal cell, but rather drugs that target the products of genes that we know cause cancer. And the first uh, breakthrough was imatinib. We have to use the uh, chemical name for it, but it's called Gleevec on, when you buy it and spend a lot of money, incidentally. And that was developed for chronic myelocytic leukemia for that BCR able gene. And an incredible breakthrough occurred when uh, Dr. George Dimitri uh, noticed that cells with a GI, which is gastrointestinal tumors in the stomach, very different from leukemia, had a gene called CKIT very different from BCR able. And it turns out that Gleevec also works against CKIT. So he took a drug that had been developed to treat leukemia and gave it to patients with stomach cancer and produced durable long-term remissions, uh, in some cases cures. And I, this set a paradigm for all of us in research saying, yes, cancer really is a genetic disease 
and we're going to be treating the gene abnormality, not the type of cancer. And a treatment for leukemia might work in stomach cancer if the right genes are abnormal in the leukemia. Uh, PARP is a, an enzyme that is important for repairing DNA that's been damaged. And BCR, uh, BRCA2, that's breast cancer one or two genes, were two genes that were discovered that are hereditary uh, predisposition uh, risks for cancer. If a, a woman carries one of those two genes in an abnormal form, by the time she's 70, she has probably a 70% risk of getting breast cancer. Most genes that cause cancer are damaged not by inheritance, but through carcinogens like cigarette smoke. But this is an inherited gene that's also important for repairing DNA. So uh, an important paper was published four years ago showing that if you took a drug that interfered with DNA repair, that's the PARP inhibitor, and gave it to a patient who had this mutation, so they already had a defect in DNA repair, which is one of the reasons they got cancer, the drug was extremely effective. Whereas if the BRCA was normal, the drug was not effective. So here we are using the intelligent, uh, the information that we get from studying the genes <coughs> to devise drugs and combinations of therapies uh, that will work. Jafitinib is against the EGF receptor. I didn't point out on the slide, uh, I did mention on the slide that we did that work in 1983 uh, with the EGF receptor. Uh, subsequently, a number of other drugs were developed against the EGF receptor. And this paper in 2009 showed that <clears throat> in advanced lung cancer, if you had a mutation, an abnormality in the gene for the EGF receptor, so that the protein product of the gene would be abnormal, uh, that patient did better on gefitinib, which is a drug that attacks EGF receptors that have been mutated, than standard chemo. On the other hand, <coughs> if your EGF receptor was normal, the patient did better on standard chemo than they did on the drug that targeted the product of that gene. So now we're getting some sophistication in here where uh, drugs don't work against the normal gene but do work against the mutated gene, which helps us in terms of planning toxicities. And another very important paper came out in 2010. Uh, there was a drug called crizotinib that was being developed against lymphoma, which is a cousin of leukemia. It's a, it's a blood cell disease. And uh, it was found the target is, the, is a combination of two genes called ALK and EML that are rearranged. Uh, and it's very common in lymphoma, 30 or 40 percent of patients. It was found that 3 percent of patients with lung cancer had that same problem. Again, lymphoma, now we're on the lung cancer. Uh, if 3% if of patients have an abnormality and you treat all lung cancer patients, uh, if, if the drug worked perfectly, you're only going to get a 3% response rate and it'll never get approved at the FDA and it won't be an important drug. But the researchers screened 1,700 lung cancer patients to find about 70 that had that mutation. And they tried this leukemia, the lymphoma drug, against that subpopulation of lung cancers that had that genetic abnormality, and the response rate was way over 50%. And these were patients with advanced lung cancer that had failed all other therapies with a life expectancy of three or four months. And the average life expectancy among the responders was nine months, and some of them had one, two, and even three-year uh, survivals on this therapy, which was unheard of in advanced lung cancer. So again, <clears throat> a sophistication. Let's only treat patients with a drug where if the patient has the genetic abnormality for which the drug was designed to attack the product of that gene. And there's another example up there too. So in summary, what we're saying is, <clears throat> uh, well, I will summarize, I didn't say it. Uh, we've identified most of the genetic abnormalities that cause cancer. The list is probably two or 300 genes. You have 22,000 genes in your body. They control your hair color, your IQ, your skin color, but about two or 300 of those genes, maybe a few more, control whether a cell divides properly or not. And those are the genes that are the cause of cancer. Lots of other things contribute. The environment contributes, 
the immune system contributes. But the basic cause is a genetic abnormality, and I'll state it again, not usually inherited. Anybody over the age of 30 in here, when you hear the word genetics, you think it's an inherited problem. No, genetics means it's a problem in genes, and in this case, the abnormality in the gene is acquired due to damage primarily in our country. 30% of all cancer deaths are due to carcinogens in cigarette smoke dan uh, damaging genes. So if we all quit smoking, the most important thing I can say tonight is if we all quit smoking, we'd, we'd cut cancer deaths 30% without cloning any more genes, without training any more doctors or building any more hospitals. And, and anybody that has a, uh, a mechanism for teaching and persuading teenagers not to smoke, you ought to win the Nobel Prize. It's very hard to influence teenagers. And if you don't smoke before you're 20, you probably won't smoke. Uh, there are 800 drugs now in the pipeline, mostly from biotech companies and drug companies, that tar target the products of some of these three or 400 genes. And now uh, we can test those genes and determine whether they're present or absent in an abnormal way in a reasonable time frame, in a week or less, and at a reasonable cost uh, for a few thousand dollars. So in the past five years, we suddenly are able to take an individual patient's tumor and ask what genes are abnormal, where are the mutations, where are the aberrant gene functions in his or her individual tumor out of that list of three or 400 genes, which ones were wrong in that patient's tumor. Um, this is a diagram from a paper <clears> that should be required reading for anyone in biology. Uh, it's a brilliant discussion of the different influences in a cancer cell. And here we are. Uh, can, it's blurred. Is it blurred for you, too? Yeah. It's too bad. All right. Well, this is, <laughs> I don't know. You know, we used to have slides and a projector, and they were terrific. Uh, <laughs> PowerPoint is awful. Uh, sustaining proliferation signals. This is like the EGF receptor turned on. It won't turn off. This is uh, evading suppressors of growth. Uh, this is blood vessels somewhere down here, I remember. Uh, tumor provoking inflammation. Inflammation can promote a, t a tumor. Here's genome instability we talked about. There's that PARP. Uh, resisting cell death. There's 12 characteristics of cancers. Each of those are driven by genes. And most of the genes that we think cause cancer slip into one of those categories. Here's another diagram by a man named Vogelstein. Entirely different data set. He isn't interested in biologic processes. He's interested in pathways in cells that relay information. And by coincidence, that's that darn pointer again. I'm going to put it down again. Uh, by coincidence, he comes up with 12. Now, it may be we're going to have to attack 12 different gene products in order to cure cancer. To cure tuberculosis, you have to give triple therapy. You give three drugs. To, to treat AIDS today, you don't cure it, but you, you produce a normal lifespan in most patients. It's triple therapy. Well, cancer is more complicated. It may take more than three. And this is frightening in a way. But we are trying to keep track of these various genes and the pathways with which they work. Well. Uh, with the information that we had available beginning about five years ago, just about as I was retiring as uh, the, direct, the president of MD Anderson Cancer Center, we created an institute for personalized cancer therapy. And uh, we advertised it, and we had a lot of people apply for it. And everybody wanted to sequence more genes and do more research discovery. And what we wanted to do was to take the research information and the equipment that was available and apply it to patients and select therapy for patients, which wasn't as interesting a scientific question. It's a logistics question. It's applying knowledge we already have to an individual patient. So uh, I applied for the job as I was retiring, and, and I, I received the job, and now I'm working at MD Anderson uh, directing this institute, with, which is a small institute. Most of the research is being done in our clinics by the doctors who are taking care of the patients, but we're setting up the infrastructure so that we can sequence their genes. 30,000 patients a year, how do we get that number? We're treating about 100,000 patients. Cancer, uh, when I was born, about a third of patients with cancer lived five years. Today, two-thirds live five years, and most of them are cured. One-third don't. 
That means sometime in that five-year period, standard therapy is failing and they're gonna die from their cancer. They are candidates for experimental targeted therapies, these new drugs we're talking about, and that's where we get the number 30,000. It's a, roughly a third of 100,000. Now this is a diagram of a cell. Let me get this awful tool out again. And the, uh, for those of you that are not in biology, this is this, the outside membrane of the cell. Here's the nucleus. Here's all these receptors, like uh, were first described by Ehrlich. There are uh, probably a couple of hundred, and they all have different names. And then the receptors stimulate molecules in the cell, which stimulate the molecules downstream, and eventually uh, signals, chemical signals are sent to the nucleus, and new proteins and new products are made, and the cell becomes what it does what it is being instructed to do from information fed in that way. And I'm gonna talk about these pathways again. Uh, in, in about 2005, really before a lot of the technology was available, uh, Dr. Hong and his colleagues at MD Anderson decided to test the hypothesis that if drugs, new experimental drugs were given to patients based on what was abnormal in their tumor, it would be better than just giving new experimental drugs to any patient with advanced cancer. So these are the four targets he picked. One of them is a receptor on blood vessels because cancers, this is angiogenesis. And if you block angiogenesis, you can prevent cancer growth. And the other three are a surface molecule, an internal molecule, and a molecule that works uh, near the nucleus. So for each of those four targets listed here, there were experimental drugs available. They uh, required patients to undergo a biopsy. We had a huge fight with our ethics committee. The ethics committee at MD Anderson, we, we are the ethics committee, we rotate, so the faculty get on the ethics committee. When they get on the ethics committee, they're, they're their own worst enemy. The ethics committee felt it was unethical to demand a patient with advanced lung cancer to have a needle stuck in their chest to do a biopsy in order to get on this trial. Uh, we eventually won that fight, and it's becoming standard of care because I, I explained to you that one type of cancer, 3% of lung cancer patients have that abnormality. 97% shouldn't get the drug, which costs $10,000 a month, but the 3% that do have it can benefit from it. So he, he here's the drugs and here's the targets. And uh, in, interestingly, only, as I remember, only one patient turned down being biopsied. Advanced lung cancer, smokers, chronic bronchitis, sick, ready to die, expected lifespan, four months or less, they agreed to the biopsy because they wanted to have the hope of participating in this trial. And you, when you explain this to patients, it's hours of time. Uh, the first uh, 100 patients, even though we had all this information, they knew they were gonna be randomized to these drugs. The second 150 patients got a drug that matched what was wrong in their tumor. And we asked the question, did that second 150 do better than the first 100? And these are some of the results that were published uh, in 2010 and 2011. <clears throat> Here's four examples here where uh, the drug treatment that uh, where the patient had a tumor with the target of that drug, uh, there was improvement in survival that was statistically valid. And interestingly, there was one drug here where if, remember we mentioned the EGF receptor, if that was mutated and you gave this drug, the patient did worse. They did worse than if they just randomly got one of the new drugs. So again, it's gonna take very careful thinking and planning to do this, but in principle, this was the first published data in a randomized way that showed that if you treat a patient with a drug that targets an abnormal genes product, they have a better chance than if you just randomly give them a drug that targets uh, a product of a gene they may not, that may not be mutated. And the other experiment that was done at MD Anderson that uh, stimulated us to set up this institute uh, was carried out by Dr. Kurzrock and Dr. Simberidou and their colleagues in our department. Phase one trials are the trials done with new drugs that are being given for the first time to patients. Uh, phase two, uh, is intermediate, and phase three are the ones before they go to the FDA where patients are randomized. And uh, the, the technology was just getting in place where we could look for mutations in these seven genes and look for the loss 
of this eighth gene. So we had a list of eight genes which were uh, commonly abnormal in cancer, and we had that data on patients. Uh, over a period of five years, there were many clinical trials at MD Anderson with drugs that targeted these various uh, uh, genes, uh, the products of these various genes. And if possible, a patient was placed on a treatment that, uh, where the, treat the experimental treatment targeted what was wrong in their tumor. But in many cases, that couldn't be done. We didn't have a drug available at the time, or if we did have a drug available in the trial, you're only allowed to put three patients on a trial, and you have to wait to see about toxicity before you put another three patients on, and sometimes the patients couldn't wait. Well, when they pulled their data get together after five years, here's what they found. Here are 178 patients where the therapy matched the gene abnormality. This is called a waterfall plot, and red is good. That means the tumor shrank, and green is bad. It means the tumor go, uh, it was go and the tumor grew. And you can see here that complete response and partial response was 2% and 26% in patients where the therapy, experimental therapy, unimproved by the FDA, this is a clinical research project. The, the project, the research is improved, but the drug can't be purchased. Uh, or a uh, prescription can't be written. And if the therapy these same patients that uh, got did not match their tumor, uh, you can see there's far fewer red, and the number of responses was only 7%. So there was a fourfold higher response rate in the patients that got the match. And if you look at survival, in this case, the red are the match, and the uh, yellow are the non-match, and this is time, and this is percent survival. And if you look up here, the median survival, half the patients got matched treatment lived 13.9 months. Half the patients that got the non-matched treatment, lived, they lived nine months. That's almost a 50% increase in lifespan. It's only a few months. But I'll tell you the first drug on the second slide I showed you against cancer, which we didn't talk about, uh, was methotrexate that blocks folic acid metabolism, and it, it, it produced an expansion of life in kids with leukemia from three months to six months. They all died within six months instead of three months. Progress comes in little leaps, and then we get better and better at it, and we treat not people with advanced cancer, as in this case, but earlier cancer, and the drugs are more effective. So with this information, the battle trial and this trial, that was the rationale of why we set up IPCT, which is the Institute for Personalized Cancer Therapy, uh, that again, I have the pleasure of, of organizing. So we have a number of research programs, and the most important one I'm going to describe in detail to you is the Clearinghouse and Unusual Responder trial that has started, but we're going to be uh, doing clinical trials trying to understand why some patients are cured and others aren't based on the genetic makeup of their tumor why some patients get toxicity and the others don't, based on the genetic composition of their own body, not the tumor. You can give the same drug to two different people and you'll get different toxicities, and it has to do not with the tumor, but the patient's normal body. We're gonna be looking for blood-based markers so we don't have to put needles into people. Uh, right now, you can get a lot of tests done on your blood, but there are no, the PSA test is an imperfect test that tells you something's wrong with your prostate, we can talk about that but there, there, we need better markers in blood. And then the platforms at the bottom of this slide are the uh, infrastructure we're putting in place because the clinicians don't have a, they couldn't set this up. We had to hire people that know how to run the machines that do the sequencing and analyze the data. Uh, we're gonna eventually get into proteins, omics, genomics, uh, protein omics, metabolomics, immunological omics. Uh, the bills are gonna get higher but the uh, inappropriate use of therapy is gonna get lower, which I think will cancel the costs and it'll help the patients. And then the bioinformatics and computation are huge. There are uh, three billion pieces of information that come out when you sequence one gene. Nobody reads it. It goes into the computer. The computer has algorithms to read it. There are mistakes made one out of every million reads. There are three billion reads. There's a mistake one out of a million, do a simple calculation. There's 3,000 mistakes. 
So we have to sequence the DNA over and over again. And if the same abnormality turns up over and over again, it probably isn't just a random error of the machine. It probably really exists. That kind of statistics has to be done on the products of these uh, sequencing machines. So this, this slide summarizes the two research protocols we have. And I'll pick up this instrument again. One is called Clearinghouse. Uh, we opened that last March. In the first year, we had sequenced uh, some genes in 1,500 patients' tumors. The year before, it, it had been far fewer patients until we opened this protocol. And again, these are patients that have advanced cancer. They failed all the therapies that are available and are candidates for some of these targeted therapies. Now, if we find a targetable aberration in their tumor, uh, maybe there's already an approved gene like that Gleevec, and we can just give it. There's, anybody can write the prescription. Sometimes we have a clinical trial going, studying a drug that targets that gene abnormality, and sometimes it's a new gene abnormality where we don't have a clinical trial going, but there is a drug that might work against that gene, and we'd like to get a hold of that drug and make it available to the patient, which is very hard, and I'll come to that at the end of the talk. It's the hardest thing to do, is to get a hold of experimental drugs and match them to the patient. The companies are reticent to give them out, and even if a drug has been approved, uh, for one, let's, these drugs are expensive. Some of them are five and $10,000 a month. If the drug is approved for treating, uh, let's say, lung cancer, and you find a gene abnormality in someone with colon cancer, most insurance companies won't pay for you to give that drug to the colon cancer patient. It's only been approved by the FDA for the lung cancer patients. So that's the kind of uh, mess we get into. Uh, sometimes we don't find any targetable genes in our screen, which is really for a, a few dozen genes. Then we go to uh, a discovery phase. This is all being done in a hospital laboratory that is certified so that we can make patient decisions. Over here, we screen for 200 genes, and we're going to go up to 400 genes. Remember, I told you the list is probably around 400. We're going to look for mutations in any of those genes. We're going to characterize them. Uh, if we find something in a patient that we think might be useful that didn't turn up here, we can take the specimen over to the clinical laboratory and repeat the uh, sequence analysis and then give the information to the clinician <coughs> to use for decisions. That's, that's one big project. The other project is the Unusual Responder Project, which I think is the most interesting. And I'm just going to run through the first example here. Here, <coughs> previously, we can take the original tumor and look at it. Uh, to take, we take the slides from the pathology department that the original tumor, uh, 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 the slides were banked at our pathology department. We scrape the tumor off the slide and we extract the DNA from the scraped tumor off the slide, and we sequence that extracted DNA, which is pretty amazing. <coughs> Here, <coughs> we're looking at patients that responded at a tumor progression after having had a partial or complete response. You're never, you're never lucky enough that all patients respond. <coughs> Let's say 10% of patients respond and 90% didn't, and they all had that same gene abnormality. There must be something in that 10% of patients, an additional gene abnormality, that makes them more susceptible to that drug. And <clears throat> after they responded, unfortunately, after six or nine months on the average, uh, the tumor starts growing again. They get resistance. New gene abnormalities have occurred. <clears throat> so we're going to be uh, biopsying the tumor and resequencing the tumor and asking what new gene abnormality occurred in that patient that now made them resistant to this drug. And if that second gene abnormality is targetable, we might give a pair of drugs to the next patient that has this problem, anticipating uh, avoiding the resistance. That's the kind of thinking. <clears throat> now, this is the uh, workflow in our laboratory, the CLIA lab. That's the hospital of laboratory where we work up patients' specimens. And uh, at the beginning uh, of the year, <clears throat> in March, we were screening for 12 genes. And by the end of the year, we were screening for 46 genes. And I'll show you a list of those genes in just a minute. 
the technology is advancing so fast and the costs are going down so fast that we don't want to set up uh, detailed sequencing capabilities because next year we'll have to buy all new equipment. There, there are companies that are developing these capabilities and uh, uh, we're going to be sharing some of the burden with the companies, in, in essence, outsourcing. So uh, now we're looking at 46 genes. Uh, remember I told you if, if we don't find anything abnormal, we can take it to the research lab and using different technologies, we can look for abnormalities in 200 or now 400 genes. And then if we find an abnormality, we have to give it back to the clinical lab before we can treat the patient. And eventually, we'll be looking at the whole genome uh, when we know how to handle that information. There are 22,000 genes in the genome. Maybe some of the genes that don't cause cancer are important to let the cancer grow. In fact, we know that. And, uh, but uh, right now, if you sequence the whole genome, you get so much information back, most of which you don't know what to do with. So we're concentrating in this clinical patient care environment on genes where we know there's a drug that targets the product of those genes or is likely to be a drug soon. So here's a list of the genes. Here's that EGF receptor we mentioned. Uh, genes like companies IBM and uh, uh, AT&T, they have three and four letter code names. I'm not going to begin to cover that. But here's a panel of 46 genes, and we're looking at uh, 740 different mutations. So each of these genes has many different mutations it might have in it. And we're, we're looking not at the whole gene, we're looking at the mutations that are known in cancer. There are other mutations that we're missing because we're not looking for all mutations. But the uh, equipment we use can do that. Now I'm going to switch to engineering and give you a few slides because this equipment is so incredible. And this is a, a place that's very famous for its bioscience and engineering. So uh, this is called the ion torrent machine. It was available commercially about a year or two ago. And uh, the DNA is extracted from the tumor, and it's chopped up in little pieces uh, through mechanisms I won't describe, and it has labels attached to it. So you have uh, all the DNA broken into small pieces. You separate the double helix. We all know what a double helix is. That's what we're celebrating, the double helix today uh, from Watson and Crick's paper. And uh, we have beads in test tubes, tiny beads. These beads are very small. And we have many more beads in the test tube than we have pieces of DNA. And the DNA sticks to the beads. So we have some beads that have no DNA on it, some that have one little piece of DNA, and some that have two or three, and you have to get rid of those. And I won't go into that. Then we do a reaction called the PCR reaction, which replicates many copies of this one strand of DNA. So now we have on this bead, a lot of strands of DNA. The bead is dropped into a well, and we add to the well the uh, components. There are four bases. As, as DNA grows, there are four bases that are attached to it, and uh, they're color-coded here. Two of them are color-coded red and green, and the green one is added, and if, if it's ready for a green one here, and I'm not going to explain how, the cell, how, the, how, how we know the green is needed, uh, it'll be added. And if it's supposed to be a red one here, nothing will be added. Then we wash that out and add red. And if red's supposed to be added, it gets added. And if it was yellow that was supposed to be added, an, uh, another gene, uh, another uh, base to, to form this gene, nothing happens. And uh, this is recorded on a pH meter. Now, what's going on here? Sequentially, we're adding and, uh, over a period of milliseconds, uh, hundreds, thousands of a second, adding something and then washing it out and adding something and washing it out. And in real time, what's happening, uh, this is a chip that's about twice the size of my fingernail. And on that chip are little wells, like the one we just showed on the previous slide, that are 3.5 micrometers in size. That's very small. Little balls, each well holds one little ball. And the little ball is about two micrometers in diameter. And uh, the, the fluids containing these materials we're adding are flooded over there and then sucked out and flooded over there and sucked out many times per second. And there is a pH meter attached to the bottom of this well that records changes in pH. And it turns out 
if red, green, yellow, and blue, let's say that there's four bases that can be added, whichever base is added, it changes the pH a different amount. And this little thing down here, the pH meter, is recording the changes in pH in mil every few milliseconds when another reaction occurs and keeping track of it. And by keeping track of what base is added on here, you get the sequence of the bases on that piece of DNA. And if even 10% of you understood that, I'll be appreciative. But you can see the technology, which is incredible. We're here not because of great work of molecular biologists and geneticists alone. We're here talking about this because of incredible engineering and bioengineering and, and uh, nanotechnology. And for the chemists in the room, um, here's a base being added to a strand of DNA. There's three phosphate groups here. Uh, they affect pH. As the base is added, two of the phosphates are knocked off. There's a hydrogen here that is released Varying amounts, depending on which base is here. There are four different bases. The amount of hydrogen released varies depending on which base. And the pH meter is measuring hydrogen release, and it's measuring it every few milliseconds. So that's one of the technologies that's been developed. Now, this is a list, and I'm not even going to spend any time on it, of the 200 genes that are uh, being checked in that T200 uh, format. And uh, we talked about the battle trial. The doctors stay up all night in vetting names for their trials. Attack, uh, mellet, I don't know what mellet means. Uh, beat it for breast cancer and then battle two. And each of these trials in MD Anderson is on that same format and we need a lot more of them. And we're beginning to now look at what we're finding out from these patients. And this is the first few hundred patients that had sequence. And now these are some of the genes that we were screening for when we only had a list of 40. And the most common gene to have a mutation is called PIC3CA. 3 3 it, it, is, it is a gene that's right near the surface of one of those receptors on the surface of the cell. And uh, among, I think it was four or 500 patients, over 80 had a mutation in that gene. That's a, that is a great product, and there are 12 drugs uh, in, in, in the market being studied, they're all a little, little bit different, but they all attack the abnormal PIK3A. This is KRAS, here's MET, and you work down, and here, these are very rare changes that are found in those genes. We're beginning to get an atlas of, of what's going on in the cancer. We're uh, now doing the hard part, which is to collect the data out of the charts. Uh, we don't have a great computer system. Uh, it has to be done manually. Uh, but we want to find out how many potentially, potentially actionable genes were in each patient's cancer. Uh, it turns out the average cancer patient, when you add up all the mutations you find, may have dozens. Some of them have hundreds of mutations. Only a few of those are driving the tumor. You remember that way back I showed you two slides with 12 uh, driving forces in cancer. Uh, there are genes... If, if there's a gene that affects hair color and it gets mutated, you don't care. Your hair might get white earlier. It's not going to cause cancer. But actionable genes are ones that there are drugs for to treat cancer. Uh, we want to then know how many were actually acted upon. And that number is lower because I told you it's hard to get a hold of the drug. We don't have trials with all these drugs. And then we want to obviously measure the clinical responses. So there's a huge data gathering process that's, that's begun in the past few months at MD Anderson. Now, there are many challenges for the future, and I'll just run through some of these. First of all, genes uh, are the uh, blueprint in a cell, but a cell is a biologic entity, and there's so much more we have to understand about the biology and the molecular aspects of the cancer cell that are programmed by the gene, but you have to understand what the gene does before you can uh, attack it optimally. There's heterogeneity in cancer cells. Cancers are undergoing Darwinian inheritance in real time. Uh, to be a giraffe from a, an animal with a short neck, it probably took uh, 100,000 years of gene mutations. Cancer gene mutations are occurring as the cancer grows in our body. It develops resistance to drugs because of this. It develops the ability not only to grow, but to spread through the body. That's called metastasis. Some cancers never do that. That's great. 
but some do. So uh, they're heterogeneous. It isn't going to be just one set of genes in a patient's cancer that we'll be attacking. We have to figure out which gene mutation is driving the cancer and which we call a passenger, like eye color or something like that. And then the other genetic influences that affect the drugs I've referred to. Now, the clinical process is much more complicated. Uh, five years ago, if a patient came to the hospital with cancer, they usually saw the surgeon first, 10 years ago. The surgeon operated and handed off the patient, either the radiotherapist or the chemotherapist. Today, the most important person is the pathologist, because they're running all these tests. So we have to have a team not only that includes the medical, surgical, and radiotherapy doctor, but the pathologist, <clears throat> and then the interventional radiologist that knows how to stick a needle into a chest without hurting a patient. And none of these patients were hurt in that study, the battle study. And it, it's a team that has to work together. The logistics of, of, working people, of people working together in a hospital where they're usually spread out, the radiotherapy is usually in the basement, the surgeons like the, the nicer offices and they're in a different office building from the medical people, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm being silly here. Uh, we have a clinic called the Nellie Conley Breast Clinic. It's the size of a football field. And the surgeon, medical oncologist, radiotherapist, and uh, interventional radiologist come to that clinic. There's one hello window. If you have breast cancer, you walk up to that window, you can see any of these doctors. You still have to walk around a bit because it's a big floor in, in a building. But we're trying to figure out how to do this team sport. Number three, we still have to figure out how many targets. I told you it could be up to 12. My guess it's going to be four or five. Uh, it'd be rare for one target to be enough. In that one disease, chronic leukemia, that we talked about at the beginning, Gleevec, there's only one gene abnormality initially. And there, if you block that gene, you're, you're changing the course. How many omics? Should we be doing proteomics? We don't know how to do it well enough yet to do it in a routine way. <clears throat> what does it take to kill a cancer cell? Number four. Clinical trial design gets very complex. I showed you how complicated it was to do that trial where we had four different drugs and four different tests. Well, what are you going to do if there's 200 targets and, and you've got 200 drugs and each one requires uh, permission from the FDA to give an experimental drug? That alone is, alone is a uh, logistical nightmare <clears throat> that we're trying to figure out how to solve. Uh, I mentioned the imprecision of sequencing and the need for <coughs> its pollen season in Houston. Uh, the, the imprecision and the need for bioinformatics to figure out what you've learned once you do the sequencing. <coughs> the new therapies are very expensive and the trials are expensive. Uh, the uh, tests to decide which therapy are expensive. So all of this gets balanced out. We believe if we give the right therapy to the right patient, we're actually going to end up saving money. But in order to get there, we're going to have to spend money. Most of the studies that I told you about are not reimbursed. So we have to use grants, hospital margins, and philanthropy uh, to run these tests. And per patient, it's probably around $25,000. So you can do a simple math. If you're doing a 200-patient trial, you've got millions of dollars involved. Um, <clears throat> The regulatory authorities are very risk averse. Uh, if a patient has advanced lung cancer, they may say, give me two drugs or three drugs if I've got three different things. There may be toxicities you don't know about. So the FDA likes us to work with one drug at a time usually. It's beginning to change. But if you take a list of 800 new drugs and look at them one at a time, it'll be the year uh, 2200 before we figure out what to do. We've got to figure out a way to uh, address risk and allow uh, drugs to be combined sooner. <clears throat> uh, a lot of this is very sophisticated science. The average doctor is 40 or 45. They didn't have any of this in medical school. They're trying to pick it up. We've got to give uh, decision support tools to our clinicians that explain what they're doing. Uh, a doctor and a patient have a very special relationship. A doctor is not going to advise a patient to take a drug unless the doctor feels it's the right thing for the patient, which means the doctor has to be educated so they can understand the report. So we have to give a report to a doctor that is meaningful to someone who understands science but may not understand how that darn machine worked that we tried to describe together. And we're working on those tools. 
This is going on at many medical centers, at little cottage industries. If I were running Microsoft, I'd do it and sell it to everybody uh, because it's, it's going to be a very lucrative business. There are ethical concerns. Uh, we're sequencing a genes in, in, a, in a cancer. Suppose we find the BRCA gene. This is a patient who comes in, let's say, with uh, a cancer in their colon. BRCA has nothing to do with colon. If you have BRCA, you get breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Now, the patient has advanced colon cancer, and here we find one of those genes, PI3C kinase, the common one. We also found a BRCA mutation. Now, that patient, that's an, that's an inherited abnormality. That means that patient's daughters might have that gene. They're in, the, in for cancer treatment. What are the ethics here? Must you tell the patient you found this abnormality? Who should tell the patient, a genetic counselor or a cancer doctor who really isn't equipped to answer the daughter's questions about what to do with that information? So we've got a lot of ethical issues. That's just one example to deal with as we uncover more and more information about people. It's supposed to be kept private, uh, and we how much of it should be shared. I'm a believer in sharing, but it requires education. It requires hours spent with the patient and their family. We're paid for procedures and tests and drugs and x-rays. We're not paid for explaining things to people. Uh, so we have to figure out how to handle that. We have to prove this works in, in a large population and not just in the reported studies like I showed you uh, in order to get it reimbursed, and we're working hard on that. We have to understand resistance, and I'll just mention it at the end, immunotherapy is very important. Uh, using the personal immune system to attack the cancer, and that's the subject of another talk that we won't do today. And I'm going to skip that slide. The two biggest bottlenecks, one is hoarding of information. We're collecting a lot of data. It has to be stored. Incidentally, storing the data for five years is more expensive than running the test on the machine. And uh, there are some people that take the data and destroy it, and if they need it again, they'll rerun the test rather than put it up on the cloud. Um, medical informatics is complicated. That third bullet is the key one. Data balkanization in hierarchical organizational structures. What did I mean when I wrote that politically correct statement? I mean that people hoard their data because they think there might be intellectual property in it and they can make money. Universities want to make money. The researchers want to make money. The drug companies want to make money. And the, how do you share data and protect intellectual property? Uh, the lawyers are having a feast with this. But if we're going to really move this along as quickly as possible, we have to solve that issue. And the second one is access to these targeted therapies uh, that are maybe approved for one kind of cancer. And if that gene abnormality is in another one, the insurance won't pay for it. They, the insurance typically will not pay for experimental therapy, although Medicare does. Uh, it depends who your Medicare subcontractor is you have to deal with. But the private insurance companies uh, that, well, half the people in this room are, are working with typically don't pay for this. So we'll have to work on that too. This is the original report form we designed to pass out to the doctors. It was very naive. So here's a list of genes, and here's two different specimens. And green means it's normal, red means it's abnormal, yellow means uh, it was in indeterminate, and here somebody fudged and, and lost the information. So you just put black because you don't know. Uh, right now, this has been extended to a two-page report because wherever we see a red, we're now giving the doctor information about what that gene does with references to the literature that they can pull up, and what studies have been done, if any, in patients or uh, in, in a controlled trial, or with single patients, or in animals, so that they can have the information they need to make their decision. And the doctor has to make the decision, not the scientist who ran this test in the lab and uh, knows how to put that all together. So I've given you a, an overview of how genetics, the cancer is a genetic disease, and how the field of genetics, just in the past five years, after all the progress that's been made in the past 50 years, has now made it possible to do very sophisticated genetic analysis of each individual patient's cancer and begin to, to describe, to prescribe therapy ra on a rational basis to those patients based on what you find. It's still research except for a few examples. I gave you some of the examples already. 
but I believe it's going to become more and more common. I can't predict we're going to be as successful against cancer as we were against tuberculosis and against AIDS, but I do think that cancer, which is the number one or two killer <coughs> in the world today, some people say it's number one, <coughs> back off. In, nine, in 1900, the two most common causes of death from disease in the world were pneumonia and tuberculosis. The chemotherapy uh, brought them way down on the list. They're not gone, but they're not the two most common killers. Cancer is number one or number two today, and I believe that we're going to be able to push it down. We'll never get rid of it, but this approach, I think, is going to be, uh, uh, make remarkable gains. So thanks for your attention, and if there's time, I'll answer questions, and if there's not, I won't be able to. Thank you. <laughs> I love the combination. It's an FDA approval nightmare. <coughs> but yes, uh, I, I began my career in immunotherapy. I switched into this field in 1980 because I got interested in, in the genes that cause cancer. But uh, the point he's making is that the immune response, all you have to do is find out if there's something on the surface of that cell that you can tease the immune system into attacking. Uh, a vaccine does that. We all got vaccine for polio. When I was growing up, I couldn't swim in a swimming pool in the summer in the public swimming pools because polio was so contagious. If you get vaccinated against polio before you get the polio exposed to it, you won't get polio. Unfortunately, right now, most cancer vaccines have been designed to treat cancer after it has occurred. And you're, there's already a lot of that abnormality in the body, but we're trying to teach the immune system to kill the cancer. There are two vaccines that are preventing cancer. <clears throat> One is against hepatitis C, which is the most common cause of cancer in China, cancer deaths. Uh, cancer deaths in China are going to plummet in, in uh, liver cancer because as babies are born, and we proved you have to do it right away, they're popping out of the uterus and we're vaccinating them against hepatitis C, which they're picking up from their parents from little hemorrhages that occur as they're born. And uh, if you're vaccinating that quickly, you actually can kill the virus and prevent them from getting the hepatitis and then the cancer. And in sub-Sahara Africa, the most common cause of death from cancer is cervix cancer. It's due to a virus. There are vaccines against the virus that causes cervix cancer. And anyone in here who has a 10-year-old daughter or granddaughter knows you've got to decide, do you want to give them that vaccine or not? And I won't get into that. But yes, immunotherapy is great. Other questions? Other questions. How many years after medical school does a person have to have to get to the level that you are not, not to the level, but where you were beginning as a clinician in the field that you're in? The question is how much training do you need? After you finish medical school, today to do the kind of work I'm talking about, you need internship and you need at least two years of residency so you know how to take care of the patients. Uh, then you need uh, at least one year of clinical oncology fellowship so you know how to take care of the, the oncology problems in the patient. And you need a minimum of three years of laboratory research experience. Uh, when I did it, you didn't need a PhD. Today, if you want to do this, you probably are going to get a PhD, which is another three or four years. Then there's the postdoc. So it's 10 or 12 years. You're, uh, the average age to get your first major grant from the NIH today is 42. You can be president of the United States when you're 44, I think. <laughs> so these, these people, when I, when I wrote my first grant, I was 35 and I had a 40% chance of getting it funded. And if it wasn't funded, I could send it in again, amend it, they give you a critique. And I had another 40% chance. I was pretty sure I'd get funded. Today, the funding is at around 10%. 
you can write 10 grants before you get one funded, and the average age is much older, and it's hard. And this may be driving people. Uh, well, I'll just say that when I began this, most people from the world came to the United States, China especially, uh, and uh, India. And today, uh, many of them are going to European labs and other places because it's, it's expensive here and it's hard to get funded. We need more residency spots. Yes, we have enough people wanting to do this. It's so much fun, and it is, a, it is science, but it also involves helping people. And uh, for many individuals like myself, I started out majoring, majoring in physics and chemistry at Harvard College. And after my first year, I decided I hated differential equations. <laughs> and I didn't want to take the advanced physics. I didn't take the medical school physics. I took the physics for physicists, and they're very different. And I switched into pre-med and had the good luck to uh, land in James Watson's laboratory, which gave me, began my training, uh, a full at least three years of, of training without seeing patients, just doing research. But I enjoyed every minute of it. Yes? Yeah, lots of questions, but um, you, you mentioned pathology is the most important at the beginning now. I'm being a little cynical, but yes. You can't, you never treat a patient until a pathologist has read the slide. So in, in 2008, there was, are you familiar with Herbitux? I, I was the co-inventor of Herbitux. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> I, I didn't enjoy it very much. Um, so part of the way through 2008, the ASCO conference released a study that Herbitux didn't affect uh, adenocarcinomas that had the KRAS gene. In colon cancer. In colon cancer, right. yes. Um, are they going to, you mentioned how many genes there are. Uh, at some point, are they going to take pathology and test for every gene they possibly can in a tumor before they even take a look? I mean, how, how long are we going to get to the point where somebody doesn't take a drug that they, they didn't need? Right. Um, all the chemo we give today, some of which is curative, uh, adriamycin is one of the most commonly used drugs against breast cancer. It works in about half the patients. They lose their hair, they throw up, although there's some pretty good anti-nausea drugs now. They have a risk of getting heart trouble. And we take it for granted that, uh, okay, it will only work in half of them. We're going to try it. We're in the same spot with some of these targeted drugs until we get the information like that KRAS information that says don't give the patient. We're looking for that like mad, yes. When are we going to screen all the genes? It's a matter of handling the information and knowing what to do with it. We don't know what to do with all that information now. It's too vast and we're sticking to the genes, uh, maybe to the detriment of, of, a, of a patient like you. Uh, we're not screening for genes that don't makes sense. KRAS makes sense. It's downstream from the EGF receptor. It was postulated that KRAS would be important. <clears throat> this study was done by going back and looking at patients that did and didn't respond to Herbitux, pulling their slides, and retrospectively looking at KRAS. So this was a Gedanken experiment. People figured out this is a likely possibility, and lo and behold, it turned out true. Then we went to lung cancer. They have EGF receptor mutations. Bad luck. Doesn't matter probably. Oh, they're still fighting about it. But it's subtle enough so we're still fighting about it. KRAS abnormality does not tell you that the lung cancer won't respond to an EGF receptor inhibitor, whereas in the bowel cancer it tells you that the bowel cancer won't respond to an EGF receptor inhibitor. Why? Because there's probably another gene abnormality in the lung cancer that makes KRAS irrelevant. So the answer is we've got a lot more to learn still. The question, or, or the, actually the point you brought up about um, eth ethically do you tell the patient that you have this uh, gene mutation and you're, like for me it was important, is, is my son gonna be somebody that's gonna also have this to worry about where you know some people have a mutation. There's a private company that said we'll test you for X amount of dollars, and my surgeon recommended it. Are these outside companies? Uh, I, I mean, 
There are, well, there are what's many, your opinion on whether they're doing a, a good enough job of making sure that the there's, there's lots of kinds of outside companies. There's some outside companies <clears throat> that will analyze the genome on the tumor. They'll do really good informatics on it and analytics on it and give you the kind of report I told you we're going to be giving our clinicians. There are other companies that will take your money and hand you a disk with your uh, three billion pieces of information on it and say, go see your doctor. And boy, we hate that because number one, they probably are not CLIA approved, so they probably haven't done it as carefully as we would do it in a hospital lab. And number two, here we have to go through all this darn information. Uh, we wouldn't have tested the whole genome right now. Uh, but it is a, I told you, we're outsourcing some of what we do, and the companies have a huge amount to contribute. So we're sending some of our materials to companies to be sequenced. All right, la last one, I'll let somebody else. Um, Clinical trials, by the time a patient has gotten to the point where they've been approved or, or been asked to, to join the clinical trial, um, they're pretty beat up. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what you have to work with sometimes. I'm, I'm wondering, if, is there a way to get that to somebody that's maybe not as advanced stage? Yes. Uh, because their, their immune system is... Their immune system, their weight, their, uh, their fatigue, yeah. Uh, if a drug has a possibility of causing severe toxicity, the general rule is it's only given first to people with advanced cancer, which means they've failed everything else. Um, we have shown in breast cancer and one other, I can't remember which one now, we asked the question, can you take a patient with early stage cancer, try an experimental drug, and if that fails, put them on standard therapy, and they'll do just as well as if they got standard therapy right away. The answer is yes. So it's ethical to treat somebody with an experimental therapy early if there's not likely to be any extra toxicity from it. And the only way you find out about toxicity is first doing it on the advanced patient. So the answer to your question is we'd like to get it as quickly as possible, get the drug to earlier stage patients who have not had this Darwinian evolution and don't have that resistance gene turned on yet and are more likely to respond to the drug. You ought to go into medical research. You're asking all the right questions. Oh, uh, we'll would, give someone else a chance. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Thank you. Question, Last question. So thinking about moving what you're doing to the clinic. Yeah. The, the panel of genes you're sequencing are pretty high impact. Many, if not all of them, um, have some sort of, sort of targeted drug therapy. Right. What's the impact or your opinion of the new American College rules of returning results that are maybe less than uh, your fullest confidence and its potential impact in confounding which drugs to give? Now, which rules are you referring to? Well, the, the rules where uh, results where you see a potential sequencing error that you can't distinguish whether it's real <coughs> or an error, mm -hmm. but yet it still has to be returned to patients. Uh, if, 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 that, if, if that's been done in a CLIA lab, which means with controls <coughs> and it's reliable information, <coughs> it's my feeling it should go to the hospital chart because it may be important someday, even if we don't know why it's important today. And it, it's my opinion that we should share that with the patient if the patient wants the information. You ask the patient. We have a lot of genetic information. It's going to be in your chart. Your doctor can turn to it. Would you like it explained to you? If they say yes, you've just bought yourself an hour and a half of hard work uh, for which you're not reimbursed. But uh, you're doing something important for that patient. So I believe the, the, the securities we put in now to protect patient privacy are slowing down this kind of research. Because the best thing would be if we had a standardized uh, clinical record it was interoperable between all hospitals, like the VA has, but like no private hospital has. And our information would be shared with Sloan Kettering's information, Stanford information, and all the different cancer centers uh, with the patient's name uh, blocked out. But there are ways to trace things, and somebody's going to cheat on it. But we'll move so much faster if we could do that. So I'm a big fan of uh, the electronic medical record, not as it's used today which is an electronic photograph of a chart. I'm talking about an electronic record that's standardized, so it's the same in all hospitals. And if you have a car accident in Dallas,
they can phone your uh, hospital and, and say, this guy just had an accident and a button is pushed and your chart is available in Dallas. Uh, the summary is there. And if there's something important that could save your life, it's quickly available. Now somebody would have to sit down and read the darn chart. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>